good morning to all or good afternoon. Uh, wherever you are, my name is Vensi Marinov and I'm part of uh, Vilo Fosses uh, cattle group uh, with responsibilities for both sales and technical support uh, in several areas of our business. And um, today I'm here on behalf of uh, Mr. Klaus Anderson, who is uh, not able to join and greet us uh, this morning, but um, so I will have to step in for him and do a little bit the awkward task of introducing myself. Um, but anyway, uh, this will save a little time and um, I will not uh, continue too much with introductions, but um, I would like to say that um, when we were thinking about the topic of this um, last for the season webinar uh, on cattle, we all agreed that uh, given the challenges that we are facing with hot climate and hot temperatures, heat stress would be something that would uh, certainly be the topic of interest and um, I myself I'm very passionate about heat stress and uh, in my practice for over 15 years that has been always one of my challenges and missions so I hope that with this uh, webinar you will be able to take uh, home some messages some uh, practical points uh, as well as uh, evidence of how heat stress really impacts the profitability of, of your herd of your uh, customers, herds and business. So uh, please be aware that you can always put in questions uh, through the chat um, and uh, we will make sure that I answer them after the presentation. And certainly uh, we will be typing all the questions, all the answers to your questions and uh, send them out uh, as we finish. So with that uh, introduction, um, allow me to actually go forward with the slides and talk about heat stress. And um, I will start with a picture that I did not intend to include, but since I had a chance to take it myself, uh, this is um, how we'll start. And um, yes, it's not Friday, it's Thursday. Uh, so I'm sorry if uh, this is causing some jealousy in, in, in some of you, but I am able to take the seminar from my house by the sea. And this morning uh, I woke up early to catch the sunrise. So that's a picture as you can see just uh, shortly after 5.30. And uh, it was cool and nice and sunny. I hope you can all experience that this summer. So with that positive start for the day, uh, I have another seaside picture to, to start my presentation. And um, yes, those are not the people on my beach, but those are people that are enjoying the summer, that are ready for the summer and actually taking pleasure in in staying in in the sun's uh, suns in the sunlight and enjoying uh, the coolness of the of the sea well as you can probably guess that's not exactly the case for for our dearest animals uh, here on the right picture you can see that they are really bunching up and trying to find any shade possible because they don't like it uh, nearly uh, or in any way close to what we humans do so are we ready for the summer? Um, well, the answer would probably follow this agenda. I will try to go over what heat stress is um, and then why heat stress is important. And uh, please bear with me, even though some of the points uh, may be familiar to you, but I think it's really important that that home take home message is really um, strengthened and emphasized that it is really, really important uh, and should be avoided and should be mitigated. Um, we will go over some of the negative impacts as well as um, how, what we can do both from the outside of the cow affecting the environment and managerial um, routines and activities on a farm as well as some nutritional strategies that will help us help the system of the cow from, from the inside and uh, help her to cope with the changed physiology uh, due to the heat stress. So. What is heat stress? Um, and I will start with something that I'm sure you're all very aware and familiar with, and that is the temperature humidity index. Uh, the THI index is something that we use um, to color code the degrees of risk and the, the, the severity of, of harm that heat stress can cause. And of course, as you well know, it's, uh, it's an index, you well know it's an index that uh, correlates uh, temperature and humidity um, so you can see that the same 
index can be found both in, in lower temperatures, but in high humidity. As you can see here, um, you can have 72 here with only 23 degrees Celsius, uh, but with very high humidity. And you can find 72 index down here where it's 32 degrees Celsius with zero humidity. So really when we're talking about heat stress, always have in mind that that's something you always have to, to, to bear in mind. And uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the THI in a bit, uh, but before we do that, I would actually take like to take you back a little bit in time um, to give you the history and why THI has been updated and, not, and, and uh, adjusted for, for our current situation. So it was originally developed in back in, well, over 60 years ago. And then in 64, it was first adopted uh, for our own purposes, uh, raising cows and breeding cows. Uh, but back then, cows were not as productive. So the average uh, milk average that uh, was considered back then was about 16 kilograms of milk per day. As you can imagine, those are cows that you don't want to even keep on the farm. Uh, much less uh, have the average. Uh, so the threshold at that time was established at 72. Uh, then many, many years later, uh, Zimbelman um, updated this THI index. And um, after many studies indicated that uh, heat stress is actually um, present and um, harmful at an earlier stage, the index was actually adjusted to 68. At that time, we already had a milk average of 35 kilos a day. So as you can see, that is uh, not a static um, um, matrix or a static measurement of, of uh, heat stress, but it actually reflects the climate change and also productivity change uh, along with, with genetic improvements that we've made over the years. And one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we should not forget that the THI index does not actually consider uh, two important aspects, uh, and those are not reflected in the table, but uh, please have them in mind. The duration of the heat stress, which uh, basically says how many days, uh, what is the, the length of the period uh, where the heat, uh, heat stress is actually present. And um, studies show that the longer heat stress is on, the longer it takes for the cow to recover, for the herd to recover from the impacts of heat stress. So. Um, it's one thing if heat stress is, is there for a week. It's another thing if heat stress is there for two or three months. Um, so the other aspect is intensity. Uh, and that has to do more with the, let's say, elevation or specific regional uh, characteristics of your climate. So if you are higher in altitude, it could be that in the daytime temperatures could be high. THI index could be also high, but in the nights it could cool down and uh, that gives you a different intensity of heat stress. So just bear those in mind, although we cannot quantify it uh, and express it in any way, it does have an impact on how much the heat stress will um, will influence your, your cows. So a few words about how cows accumulate heat. Um, again, these are basic um, physics, but also uh, basic facts of, of uh, what cows are. And um, we should realize that there are two aspects of heat uh, accumulation for cows. One that we will we should not forget is the, the fermentation um, heat increment uh, coming from uh, from an inside from within inside the cow. So uh, we know uh, fermenting is an ongoing process, and the more productive the cow is, the more dry matter she will consume, and of course more fermentation uh, will will take place. And um, that is uh, just to give you an example. That is the equivalent of having a 16 set of 16 uh, 100 uh, watt lamps, and I'm talking about the old lamps that were really hot when you touch them. So imagine that um, there's a room and that uh, has 16 of those lights uh, at, on at the same time. You can imagine the heat that, uh, that the cow is is generating from from inside. And of course, the external heat load um, is, a, is a sum, a function of uh, both the solar radiation, uh, whether or not the cows are protected from direct uh, sunlight, as well as the air temperature and the relative humidity, which we already talked about uh, during the uh, DHI index. And uh, just one final equation or, uh, or function that we should not forget, as cows get hotter because of um, outside temperatures rising and, and high humidity, uh, basically, uh, the, their ability to, dissip to dissipate heat 
uh, is reduced. And the lack of that exchange, heat exchange, basically means that uh, the cow was starting to, to, to store heat. And the natural consequence of that is uh, increase in body temperature. And we will look at that, uh, both how it affects the physiology of the cow, um, the, the, uh, the eating patterns, the behavioral patterns, as well as um, some of the metabolic uh, changes that occur. So, a few fun facts, and I will go quickly through them. Basically, if we take our skin, um, we have a skin that is more or less about eight pieces of paper uh, on top of each other, whereas cow skin is, um, you know, the, the thickness of, uh, of a really heavy leather boot, but three times that. So you can imagine that the skin is much thicker. And uh, consider that uh, she has subcutaneous fat that is um, around four centimeters on a, on a normally conditioned cow. So that's another layer of insulation that she has to overcome. And as we talked about the rumen as a generator of heat, it's uh, equal or, or oftentimes more than 30,000 BTU. So the cow is really loaded with a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to dissipating uh, heat. So again, um, easy to remember. Please remember that because it's really, really uh, valid and true. When we humans enter the barn um, and we feel cold, uh, just be sure and you, you should know that the cows are feeling great. Uh, their, um, their best temperatures would be a range between 4 to 15, 18, 20 degrees. That's where they feel most comfortable. And um, I had a colleague once say that uh, if you would give the remote control for the air conditioning to the cow, she would actually turn it to about 6, 7, 8 degrees. So uh, that's us. That's cold for us. Um, but for the cow, it's perfect. So when we are cold, they are feeling great. When we are comfortable, uh, then they are starting to feel hot. And then the red light, as you can see, is that uh, when we get hot in any way and we start sweating, well, then cows are super hot. So uh, oftentimes you, you see people complaining that it's uh, that they need to close down the milking parlor, that they need to um, turn off the ventilators and the fans because they feel cold. Well, it's really uh, up to what is the focus of, of your operation. Is it the, the people? Is it the cows? Well, I would always put, put cows first since that's what's paying for those people to be there in the first place. So, uh, very quickly, how cows uh, exchange heat. Um, no too many details here, but it's important to realize that there, are, there is a transition in the mechanisms and methods uh, how cows actually ex exchange and dissipate heat. So, the, the first uh, method is through evaporation through the lungs, um, and that is panting and, of course, a little bit of sweating. Uh, even though cows only sweat maybe 10% of what we do, proportionally to us, but that's still a valid valid um, method of, of exchanging heat. Uh, then, of course, there's the conduction. And uh, here you can see uh, here at, at the hoof level, and uh, that basically means that when the cow uh, is hot, she will prefer to lie down in moist, wet areas. Uh, they will seek those areas, uh, those puddles, those, uh, um, you know, heavy in urine and, and um, and manure places because they just exchange heat that much better. And then there's the convection, uh, and that convection is basically the wind blowing through the body, outer uh, extremities of the of the cow. And uh, with luck, uh, that air will also take out um, temperature um, and evaporate some, some some water. But we'll talk about that a little later. And that's a very old graph um, slide of of um, how back in the 50s people started measuring the ways cows uh, evaporate, uh, sorry, not evaporate, but dissipate heat. And as you, as you can see, even though it's old, it's still valid. Uh, they've used some uh, chambers to get the cows um, and measure the heat dissipation on, on, on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you see the different methods. So respiratory tract, evaporative cooling, getting uh, hot, uh, getting dry air in the lungs, filling it, humid, humidifying it, getting some heat out and exhausting it. So that's very basic and, and it does the job. And then of course you have the evaporative cooling through the outer body here and the all the other three sets of methods, the conduction, the con radiation and convection, 
But as you can see, and um, I'm sorry, this is in Fahrenheit, but as you can see that as we get closer to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is more or less uh, um, 18, 19, 20 degrees, let's say 20 degrees uh, Celsius, then th the efficacy of those methods really start to change. And as you can see, there is a limit to how much the cow can, can dissipate heat by breeding. And then really the massive part of, of that potential for cooling is then evaporative cooling through her outer body. And uh, on the right here, you can see um, that basically up to 20, 21 degrees evaporation from skin and lungs is, is, is okay for a cow, she can cope. And then as we get higher in temperature, always remember humidity does play a part. Then 85% of the heat dissipation then will really de depend on the ability of the cow to vaporize water from her body. Um, so another uh, another um, study that uh, really shows that is the respiration and uh, the relationship between respiration and the THI, the, the, the temperature humidity index. And again, as you can see, both in terms of respiration rate, how many breaths per minute, and in terms of body temperature, um, as we go up in, in heat index, um, both respiration rate and temperature, body temperature increase. So that's a, a very normal um, way of coping with heat. But as we saw earlier, there's only so much that the cow can do by breeding and by panting. Uh, there's actually a, a, some negative aspects to panting, which we'll touch upon a little later, but, but you can see that it's a quite a flat line that really doesn't take uh, much of the heat out. So. Uh, another another study that was done to again highlight that fact is that you you see cows how they increase their respiration rate they increase their breeding to over 60 then 70 and the majority is here within between 80 to 100 and even exceeding 100 but that's about it that they cannot get any any further than that and that just gives you that there that's a limited uh, method of cooling for cows so let's quickly go through what we can see, observe, and, and uh, what can indicate to us that the cow is, uh, is getting hot. Uh, again, when she starts breeding faster, and that's usually 65, 70 breaths per minute, if she exceeds that, then she is hot. If you're able to measure body temperature, uh, either rectal or vaginal, then she will be 35, uh, 39, I'm sorry, uh, Celsius or more. You will see changes in her behavior. Um, they will start um, limiting their movement. They will stand more. Uh, very often they will bunch in groups, uh, seeking for that slight uh, reduction in, in, in ambient temperature. We don't feel it, but they do. So they will actually bunch where, where they feel the breeze, where they feel there's uh, some coolness. Um, and of course, uh, flies is, uh, is also a factor when we when talk about bunching. But again, of course, they, you will see that they visit the water more often. Uh, one thing we see immediately is that the dry matter intake is reduced and that can vary from 10, 12% to 30 or 40%. And that's very, very obvious. We know something is wrong. We may suspect that it's um, the silage or new organic acid in the silage or some other changes, uh, which is not good to have during that time, but always first uh, suspicion should fall on uh, on heat stress. Um, they start eating more in the cooler periods of the day, in the mornings, in the evenings, um, which has a negative uh, consequence because they eat, um, instead of having more frequent meals with less meals, with less feed, they actually tend to eat more at one visit to the table, uh, which creates a predisposition for ruminal acidosis and for overload of, with concentrate. So, but anyway, it's a sign that they're hot. And um, you may see actual sweating, uh, which is actually associated with uh, redirecting blood flow to the extremities, to, to the periphery of the cow, uh, to the skin, so uh, she can actually exchange more heat. And then, of course, we see the milk drop, uh, and that can be, I have put 12 to 16 percent, which is the average. But depending on your situation and the cow's productivity, you can see much more dramatic changes. A short video of something that we've all witnessed, our cow standing, panting, drooling, tongues out. Um, well, 
it's a very, very common site. OK, some of the consequences, I will not go through all of them. I will try to focus on a few of them because I believe it's really important that we go over them. So we see a decreased milk production and growth uh, for animals that are not lactating yet. And that milk drop can be five kilos, sometimes even more. Uh, we see reduced body condition. Uh, we see an, um, more incidences of, of postpartum, but not only postpartum diseases. Certainly lameness at the end of the summer season when the uh, when the cushion, digital cushion is um, is actually thin and the, the lesions start to appear. Uh, sore ulcers and, and other, other ulcers and other lesions of the hoofs um, associated with laminitis. Then we have more mastitis, especially if cows are looking for that wet place to lie down. We'll talk about leaky gut in a moment. We, dis we do see the, the, the rumen acidosis sometimes, but sometimes it's actually hidden. And um, that immediately brings down our income over feed cost uh, and, uh, and feed efficiency. Uh, of course, it's associated with laminitis, as we said before. So there is a significant impact on, on, on reproduction. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. Uh, higher abortion incidence, um, and all of the illnesses and, and, and reproductive failures basically mean that we call more cows. Um, then in the subsequent lactation is impaired. We'll see a, a little bit of data on that. And there's a huge impact on the next generation of cows that are born to, to mothers, to cows that are actually heat stressed. So a few a few slides on, on impact and reproduction, and I really like to, to home in on, on this message uh, because we, we tend to feel OK if we don't see a dramatic drop in milk because of good cooling systems, etc. But always be mindful of, of the fact that there is um, a lot more than there's just that. So that's uh, actually a study made in, in, in Israel, which shows how significantly Conception rates of cooled cows, so temperature, body temperatures of uh, equal or less than 39 degrees Celsius, uh, is compared to cows that are heat stressed. So first conception service, uh, first service conception rate, as you can see, it's dramatic. Uh, but also all services conception rate um, is just as equally impaired. Uh, and uh, the next slide basically shows the same association, this time expressed in, in pregnancy rate uh, information uh, data. Uh, pregnancy rate at 90 days in milk, 120 days in milk, 150 days in milk. As you can see, it just um, the, 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 the difference is, is growing as we get later into the lactation. So the impact of, of your reproductive efficiency is huge. Um, and we'll talk about cooling those dry cows later on. But uh, one rule of thumb that you can also take home is that for every half a degree Celsius of increase in body temperature, uh, cows will lose an average of 14 to 15 percent in conception rate. Uh, but we all know that practically conception rates and, and estrus uh, expressions are so much impaired during the hot uh, seasons. OK, going on to address the dry cows. And um, well, we know drop, milk is dropping. Uh, we know reproduction is affecting is affected. But there's a huge Im impact on how that late gestation cow is going to be uh, when she actually calves, but also what is the impact of her progeny in terms of growth, development, reproductive uh, efficiency, and performance of that of that daughter of our of our hot cow. So let's let's go through a few a few slides on that. Um, that's a summary of, of some slides that, that um, show you in different parts of the world. A lot of it is actually done in, in, the, in the States, but also in Israel. Um, you can see the different studies, the different methods of cooling, um, and also the production of cows, um, of those that are not cooled and those that are cooled. And again, please be mindful that we're only talking about cows that are cooled in the dry period. Uh, after the dry period, that difference between cooled and non-cooled cow is gone. They are all cooled. So you can see very, very big changes. Yes, this is in pounds. We'll see the, the graph in kilograms now, but the, the following lactation of cows that are cooled or non-cooled 
is enormously affected. And uh, here's the, the, the study uh, made in University of Florida. Uh, this is now expressed in kilograms of milk on the left. Again, these are just cool, cooled cows uh, and non-cooled cows just in the dry period. And then they're all cooled after they calf. So there's no change in, in feeding, in ration, in environment, and also in embryo temperature and heat stress. So as you can see that the, the, the difference comes pretty much straight on uh, here, just to, to, to show you, these are weeks. So they just, they follow the lactation of these animals for 40 weeks, which is more or less a full lactation. And as you can see that here, we're starting to see the opening and that opening, that difference in, in better milk basically lasts for the whole lactation. Just the fact that we cool the cows in the dry period is giving a huge, huge impact of uh, five kilograms of extra milk. So if you just calculate that based on those uh, 40 weeks, uh, well, that gives you almost two and a half tons of extra milk. So that's huge. Um, again, a summary of, of other trials that uh, measure the same thing. Uh, we will not uh, stop here, but just to show you that it's not just a single trial, but it's a number of trials basically with the same outcome. So very quickly, why that happens? Uh, we all know that um, hot cows have shorter gestation periods, and uh, that means shorter dry dry cow uh, dry uh, periods. And uh, we do suspect and suspect, and we do know that um, one aspect of why cooled dry cows do better in the following lactation is because of the hormonal output of the placenta and the longer gestation and dry period that they have. But it's not only that, without going into big details, um, uh, the University of Florida have studied and have uh, looked at um, the impact of cooling on memory, on the memory tissue and uh, whether or not uh, we're talking about more uh, secretory cells in the mammary gland or better efficiency and in in higher metabolism of those cells. Well, it turns out metabolism is the same uh, and it's really a matter of, uh, of more cells that the cow is being able to, to generate uh, during the dry period because uh, during, and, and being cooled. So we are seeing here the epithelial cells and the difference in uh, in those cell numbers of, of stressed and cooled cows, heat stressed and cooled cows, um, the, the stroma cells and then the total. So basically what we're seeing is that cooling cows in the dry period prepares them better for the next lactation by just simply having more, more cells to secrete milk. But it's much more than that, it's beyond that. Uh, we're talking about uh, not only the dams, the mothers, but also the calves. And I have to probably speed this up a little bit, but there's a strong effect on the next progeny, on, the next, on your next cows in the herd, on your next champions. And um, again, studies show that um, those calves that are born to cooled mothers in the in the blue column here versus our control group, which are heat stressed cows, are born heavier, but also weaned heavier, uh, both in terms of changing in their body weight, but also at the time of weaning, same nutritional levels. One only difference, and that is um, their, the fact that they've been in utero cooled, um, their mothers have been cooled. Um, the, the studies have shown that there is actually no change in colostrum quality of those mothers, of those cows. So we're actually talking about improved efficiency of absorption of those calves. Um, and again, you can see total tract IgG um, absorption um, is improved. And again, you can see this expression also in the apparent efficacy uh, here on the right. Um, all that leads to better conception rates, first service and all service conception rates for those heifers. Um, and as you can see, we're talking about 2.6 to uh, 1.8 services per conception in those studies. And um, then talking about, again, those young babies that are born to uh, cow dry cows that are either cooled or heat stressed. Look at that. That's just a mind blowing um, piece of information that I always like to, to show to my customers and colleagues. 
Well, basically, if you follow, and they did follow the lactation of those heifers, and you can see that striking difference in milk production. Everything is the same, nutrition, genetics, environment, um, but there is a difference, and the average difference is over five kilograms per day for the first 35 weeks. Uh, when you put that into the equation for those 35 weeks, it's um, 1,200 kilograms of extra milk in the first lactation, which you can expect that it will be carried over in the second and third lactation. So that study out of Florida University shows that those calves are basically programmed to be less productive. Uh, and that's, wow, talk about impact. Uh, that's for life. And uh, we are investing in our genetical pro in genetics programs. We are investing in our good nutritional uh, levels of feeding and the uh, health of these calves. And then at the end of the day, uh, we can sabotage the performance of these animals by simply neglecting to cool their mothers. <clears throat> so quickly about heat stress and dry matter intake. Again, on the left, you have the feed efficiency, and we're now talking about cows. On the right, you have uh, the calculation of feed over income over feed cost, um, and the different temperatures expressed in both in Fahrenheit and Celsius. As you can see, um, you know, as soon as we get over 20, 20 some degrees, then you have a sharp decline in both these factors that uh, really hit our, our bottom line. Uh, another Another chart made by Professor Robinson that clearly shows that as soon as we start going up in respiration, and as we talked about, respiration is affected as soon as we hit the THI of uh, 68, 70 and more. So the more breaths per minute we have, well, dry matter basically goes the other way down. So there is a strong correlation there. It's clear, we all see it very quickly. Um, a chart that basically shows us that as soon as we start increasing, uh, sorry, we start decreasing our dry matter for our cows, and this is in kilograms per, per day, then we need to make that feed uh, more dense and improve the, the nutritive uh, value of our feed just to compensate for the lack of dry matter kilograms that the cow is consuming. Um, and Please do not forget that panting, just increased panting rate, uh, breeding rate or panting can bring the maintenance levels high, higher by 20%. And that is another consideration that uh, all of us nutritionists, but also our customers need to have in, in, to keep into consideration. The same ration that we've had in May or March may not be um, good enough, nearly good enough uh, once we get into the June, July, August, September months. So quickly about what happens to the rumen. By more drooling, by more panting, the cows start losing uh, CO2. And um, they also lose saliva. Uh, with that loss of saliva uh, and loss of CO2, uh, the cow needs to regulate um, that by releasing more uh, carbonate. And that leads to Alkalosis, um, uh, alkaline respiratory al um, alkalosis, but acidosis in the rumen because she's losing the, the carbonate that she needs to buffer the rumen, both from less saliva, but also decreased rumination. Uh, the DFA, uh, volatile fatty acid absorption, is also uh, dependent on, on the presence of sodium, and that is also uh, negatively impacted by changing the, the pH of, of the rumen. Having in mind that, we need to consider some adjustments to our macro minerals, the ones that help us uh, improve um, our, our acidotic state of the rumen and improve our pH, increase our pH. So if you take uh, here, you can see the depression rate in percentages, the respiration rate going in the opposite direction as we've seen before, and then calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, we need to upregulate those just to compensate for the fact that the cow is losing them and she needs, she needs them uh, because, of, because of panting. Okay, so cows are hot. Um, they are already hot, uh, but what can we do? We, we need to do something about it. 
I will not um, take the time to go deep into every aspect of cooling the environment that's available, readily available. I will have it for in the slides for your consideration later. Um, I will only touch upon them and then talk a little bit about the nutritional approaches that we can take. But before we start with anything, let me go back to the basics. Water. Do cows have enough water when they want it? Rem just remember they're about 90 centimeters wide at the ribs. So as soon as they leave the parlor, the milking parlor, they're so hot, they need water. Do they have enough water for all of them, for the whole group? Uh, in this example, maybe you have a double 20 parlor, so that's 20 cows exiting the milking parlor. Can they actually line up next to each other and have access to water at the same time? Well, you need to answer that question for yourself. Um, but you can certainly see it when you see cows struggling and fighting over, over water. So water is really the number one thing to, re to remember. Not only is it part of, of our milk, but it's, it's part of their cooling mechanism. Um, if they had the chance to drink while in the milking parlor, they will drink about 12% of their, of their requirement at that milking parlor. So just have in mind that water consumption goes up by 50, 80% sometimes. And uh, that means that uh, you can have cows drinking 150, 170 liters of water in a day. So just be sure you have enough water. Be sure you have the water pressure is uh, and debit is, is uh, there for you to, to be able to, to get these cows to drink water. Something we hardly ever plan when we uh, plan for, when we build our barns, so we take the land that we have and we try to put the bar barn in the best uh, best position according to our logistical needs, but just be re remi just be uh, reminded that um, if we position the barn north to south, we expose the sides of that long barn to to more solar radiation, and that solar radiation will certainly negatively impact the cows. And you can see on the picture on to the left how cows are really getting away from the sunlight. So when you plan for your next improvement and renovation, next your next barn, just be sure that you also have that in that consideration in mind. Some basics of air cooling um, and air movement. Uh, please, please, please have your fans uh, located in your holding pen uh, in your milking parlor. That is the number one place where cows are really feeling hot. They're next to each other. There's hardly any movement of air. Um, for them, it's basically a, a hot hell. So cooling there with water and cooling fans is the number one priority. Then we talked about the dry cows and the transition cows, the maternity areas, of course, fresh cows, high production cows, uh, then the list follows. Um, put them in the milking pen again. Um, be sure that uh, the first line is, is over those, those stalls. Make sure that the cows will be motivated to lie down and spend as many hours as possible in their stalls. Of course, the feed line is your next option, uh, especially when you have the option of cooling those cows with, with water. Some, fact, some facts about uh, where they should be positioned, uh, 2.5 meters at least from the floor service. So uh, equipment and cows can move freely. Uh, always have them tilted. I run across many, many farms that they put the fence, they put them vertically uh, and they do nothing. Uh, they basically are useless there. Um, they spend the money, they get the technicians, but nobody does it properly. So the fence, the, the cows really don't know that the fence are there. So please have them tilted so they blow directly on the cows. Uh, the rule of thumb is that for every uh, meter of, of, of diameter of the fan, you need to go not more than 10, 10 meters distance between those two. So take the diameter of the fan and get a maximum of 10, 10 diameters distance. Um, and then you can look at the velocity of, of the air, but uh, we'll see in a minute that the air, the, the speed of the air is really important as uh, to how much and how effective the cows will be cooled. And you can see that here. Uh, it's another study back in 2004 where they put cows and you can see the control is the red line and their body temperature in this in this case it's a vaginal temperature they're all soaked at um, different five minute periods of time 
and you can see how uh, the different miles per hour impact the drop in their body temperature. And um, needless to say, the the higher the, the air speed, the more efficient the cooling of the cow is. Um, and that's a chart that I really, really like. And uh, that is um, to really highlight the fact that we are in desperate need to to put water on those cows. Uh, as you can see here, with no sprinklers, uh, fans only, and then different durations on off cycles. Again, the more water we put on those cows, the better we are cooling them. Practical tips. You never can have too many fans, only too few. The place in the fan is critical, of the fans is, is critical. Um, please maintain your fans clean and, and the belts tight because you can lose the efficiency of those fans if they're not maintained properly. Get cow, water on cows because that's how they evaporate. That's how they get the energy off their, their, their body into the water and off in the air. Um, you, you have to ev evaluate whether the one minute on for water or five minute off is, is the, the rule for you. Not always the case. And you can uh, then look at how you can maybe be more saving on water uh, as water becomes more and more scarce in maybe positioning cows, uh, sensors to the cows or, or timing the, the use of water when the cows are actually there. Uh, a little bit about what uh, Lance Baumgart and Rob Rhodes have talked about in the last few years about leaky gut and how heat stress is actually an immune activator. We don't have the time to go deeply into the subject, but that's just a, a nice picture of what uh, epithelium um, of the gut is, and those individual cells are actually connected with, with those tight junction proteins, and that is actually the barrier between everything that is outside, uh, actually in, in our gut, and technically outside of our system, of the cow system, I'm sorry, um, and and the inside, the lumen. And um, so that transport of um, lipopolysaccharides, pathogens, toxins is basically uh, blocked by those barriers, those tight junctions uh, between uh, those epithelial cells. And uh, that's basically our immune system. It's 70% of our immune system is in the gut. Uh, but what happens is that heat stress actually, and the studies that I will show you, has shown to actually break that uh, barrier, break the integrity of that barrier, and basically allow for those pathogens to, to come in. Um, that study then uh, looked at uh, two groups of cows, cows that are heat stressed, uh, and cows that are not heat stressed, but their feeding was actually adapted to reflect the same level of those heat stressed cows with drop in dry matter intake. So without having, without spending too much time, uh, it's a great study that basically shows that heat stressed cows secrete about 400 grams of lactose a day less. Um, and as we know, uh, glucose, and we, as we know, glucose is the precursor of lactose and we need lactose to make milk. So that study basically shows that uh, the cows, given the same amount of feed, the same energy and protein and, and, and mineral nutritive um, characteristics, just because of heat stress, the cows that are heat stress will produce almost half a kilo of glucose less. And just a reminder that about 70, 72 grams of glucose is needed for one kilogram of milk. So we are losing glucose. So what happens, is basically heat stress along with many other stressors activates, uh, breaks the integrity of those tight junctions. They pull apart and they open that gate for those LPS, bacteria and pathogens to, to enter the blood system. And um, basically because of the reactive oxygen species entering, we do, um, we do trigger an immune reaction and that immune reaction comes at a cost and um, that study basically proved that it's not just a matter of dry matter intake when the cows are hot but also because of uh, activating the immune system they start losing fuel for milk synthesis organic zinc 
please be mindful is a great tool to strengthen those tight those, those tight junctions and improve the leaky gut. So a few practical strategies how to further mitigate heat stress, reduce as much time in the holding pen, maybe put some cooling in the milking parlor. Um, don't don't lock cows up for for veterinary purposes during the hottest part of the time of the day. Avoid vaccination again in the middle of the day. Uh, push up, feed more frequently. Try to feed in the cooler periods of the day. Um, and use stabilizers, TMI stabilizers that will will help the cows have fresher and and more nutritive uh, feed. Remember again back to water, air, shade, and cooling. Uh, and then we're almost done with my presentation and I'll let you have some questions, but uh, I don't want to um, to forget the nutritional approaches that we can take. Um, again, please feel free to ask me questions about either of them. I will quickly go through them. Um, your best option is to keep your best forages, most uh, digestible silages and haylages uh, for that time of year when really the heat increment of those forages is important. So uh, NDF uh, creates a lot of heat because of acetate production in the rumen. So if you have forages that are highly higher in quality, use them during the, the summer and the hot periods. Um, if those that TMR is too dry, you can also uh, put more water to, to induce or to motivate, um, encourage more dry matter intake. Again, you have some some recommendations for elevated levels of macro minerals uh, with some potential milk response. Those are not guaranteed. There are some studies that show that milk response, uh, but certainly there is uh, a, there is the prospect of that and the potential of adding uh, all three of them and getting a milk response. Um, fat does not generate so much heat. Uh, bypass fat, especially. Um, so elevating that level to about five to seven percent of the total dry matter of TMR is actually going to save you uh, more heat coming from starch and, and, and silages. Um, do elevate dietary sugar as well, um, even to 10% um, where possible. Always be mindful that NDF should be mm, there to, to keep rumination going. So that's a fine balance. Um, so your nutritionist, your advisors uh, from Vilofos can be there to help you with that. Then using different antioxidants uh, to, to mitigate that oxidative stress that we talked about, um, in, in particular selenium, vitamin E and A, uh, those are really powerful tools. Uh, many people use yeast and yeast cultures to help with rumen buffering. Um, use of bypass protein is also good, especially uh, when the absorption of volatile fatty acids is, is reduced during hot periods. Uh, feeding glucose precursors is a good idea, and um, I would certainly, certainly emphasize on the use of trace minerals, and you have some guidelines as to how much to use, but those trace minerals, um, biotin as well, they improve your lameness situation, uh, your risk for mastitis, and improve overall gut health and leaky gut, as, as we talked earlier. The use of some uh, vasodilators, uh, vasodilators such as niacin, to improve the opening of the blood vessels um, is also helping the cow um, evaporate more and, and dissipate more heat and some osmolites to help on, on cell level to hydrate those cells and to maintain cell, cell volume. And my last two slides have to do with a product that we have that um, has certainly proven to be extremely efficient in my experience and uh, my customers uh, really love it. Um, that's called Fresh Foss and it's a dry product that treats the TMR or silages uh, individually, but most, most often the TMR. It's a granulated form that basically inhibits the growth of mold and, and yeast, keeps that TMR just as cold and fresh as the, during the time of, of serving that feed. You can see dramatic increase of dry matter intake versus uh, feed that is not used, uh, that is not treated with such a preservative. Um, and uh, we have the studies showing that um, fresh fossil is actually the number one compared to 
uh, the original liquid acids that are used in some other competitors. Uh, number one, in an in independent study showing that uh, keeps that aerobic stability for longest. Uh, and that's just a quick uh, reflection of that study, uh, given different treatments. And um, so that uh, that product I would strongly recommend. Uh, if you have not uh, seen it, please contact your view of false person. Uh, try it and you'll see how cows will uh, return that investment. So quick summary of what we are talking about. Please spend the money. It's not as expensive, but also change your management uh, styles to to utilize some of the strategies that we talked about. Return on investment is huge. It's a real. It's a real devil heat stress. It will be even more real as, as we go through the years because of climate change. Water will be even uh, more scarce, so have that in mind. Um, heat stress comes earlier than, than before and leaves later. It's a guest that you don't want to have in your house, but they're persistent and they stay there. Uh, you can see the impact uh, on milk production, on, on health, on culling rates, on repro, uh, dry cows, next generation. As we talked about calves uh, being programmed to be less productive if their mothers are not cool during the dry period. Um, and then again, water, 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 air and, and water for, to ventilate and cool cows, uh, use shade and then look for those managerial changes that will improve the, the time budget of the cow, the lying hours, uh, the uh, overall feed quality of the TMR, such as the fresh frost, uh, and utilize any of the strategies that we talked in terms of additives that will help the system of the cow from, from inside. So with that, uh, I probably run a little bit longer than I should have, but I'd like to wish you a nice summer. Enjoy your summer and don't forget that your cows should enjoy it as much as they can too. So please help them out with that. And so with that, thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer questions and then certainly I will uh, put answers in writing if we don't have enough time. Thank you very much, Franzi, uh, for explaining this important topic. Uh, it was really full of useful information and I hope everybody can use it. Uh, we got six questions until now. Okay. The first one is, um, are water troughs a good idea in the exit lanes? That's a good question. I've been asked that before. Um, actually, providing cows with um, water access immediately after milking is, is uh, I think, trumps and overrides any other considerations. Uh, for example, blocking cow traffic uh, when exiting the parlor. A parlor. So I would encourage uh, people to think about ideas of how to offer more water, especially if you don't have the, the ability to put more water troughs in your barn. So if the cows do not have enough water troughs, if there's competition for water when they uh, return to the barn, then well, by all means use that. Uh, just be mindful of your of your setup so you don't block cow traffic. Uh, so yeah, my, my short answer is yes. In hot summer, yes. Mm -hmm. Is it good to cool dry cows in the whole dry period or only in the close up? Um, well, that's also a good question, and we did not have time to actually look deeper into one of those studies that uh, looked at dry cow cooling. Uh, but they actually did that. They went through the, to the length of, um, to the degree of splitting cows and cooling them only in the far off period, uh, and then no cooling in the in the close up. And they they had the other setup uh, as well, so no cooling in the far off, cooling in the in the close up. Uh, and it clearly shows that the effect uh, that um, you have on the cow for the next lactation, but also for for in utero development of the of the calf, um, uh, is uh, certainly there at strongest when they're cooled for the entire dry period. So short answer is cool them for the entire dry period. Yes. Should I feed equal quantity of TMR both morning and evening? Uh, yes, except for for the time when you're challenged with heat stress. Um, you can still do it, uh, but I would certainly 
maybe do it 60 40 uh, 60 percent uh, feed in the in the evening because after the evening temperatures in the night are are lower cows feel more comfortable and they have more appetite and they're they do want to eat more so i would say actually 40 60 40 in the morning so you don't have too much feed sitting in the in the hot uh, air hot climate and 60 in the evening can you share more about the role of ndf and the ratio uh, during the hot period um always keep ndf at 28 30 percent um and that's that's a healthy healthy level to have um because um yes ndf uh, has high uh, heat increment and will generate more heat but um ndf is crucial for the well-being of the room and so uh yes we increase the density energy density of the of the diet by putting more concentrate more grain and more fat but um that does does not have to be at the expense of ndf um, so I have NDF effective uh, fiber to stimulate rumen function, um, but also going back to the quality of the silages. Keep your best silages for that time of, of year. My experience is, uh, unfortunately, that uh, due to bad planning, many farmers open the new haylages, uh, whether it's wheat or triticale, the new um, the new uh, alfalfa haylages, exactly at the time of heat stress. Uh, because they don't have anything else maybe they even run out of corn silage if that's the main forage and they actually uh, have another problem on their hands the heat stress and also silage that uh, have not uh, stayed long enough uh, to where their their quality is improved over time as they stay inside so yeah that's kind of a long answer to that question mm -hmm. uh with a product like fresh Force, can i feed only once a day um actually that's a great trick <laughs> that uh, that uh, i've had some people use uh, i would not recommend it as a standard rule uh, always feeding more times through the hot uh, period is better but um, if uh, labor or any other challenges uh, um, you know tempt the farmer to feed only once a day well using fresh falls is a saver uh, otherwise, cows will eat so much less, produce less, and have all the negative impacts of, of heat stress. So, uh, actually, that's uh, that's a, a lifeline um, if you're if you're planning to feed only once. Um, so, yeah, but use it even though if you feed two times, that will change uh, the outcome for sure. What about the use of elect electrolytes in the water? Well. Electrolytes you can use, um, but they do not really compensate, depending on the el electrolyte composition, they cannot really make up th those deficiencies in, in macro and, and trace minerals. So they, they will help the cow to rehydrate, uh, but that's more or less the, uh, the, the total effect of electrolytes. You can use them, uh, you can certainly use them after freshening, you can use them when you move them. Uh, electrolytes are a great tool to help the system, but uh, combat combating heat stress and mitigating heat stress with electrolytes is, I would actually employ some of the other measures before I spend my money on electrolytes for that purpose. Mm -hmm. What is your recommendation for cooling with water? What is the best practice, fog or drip cooling of animals? Um, I have my own bias. Um, I always prefer that water, that cows are soaked to the skin with heavy drops of water so that the water doesn't just, if it's too fine of a drop, the water will stick on the cow's back and actually create an insulation layer and not be as effective. So if you're actually putting water on the cows, on the back of the cows, you, you soak them, soak them until they're so wet that you you see water dripping off their ribs on the side of the of the side of the cow. As soon as you see that, that the water is dripping, stop the water because then you're using water and it's not effective and you're filling up your lagoon with with extra water and then put the, the, the air on uh, to evaporate that water uh, once that water has taken the energy from the cow and the temperature from the cow. Uh, so I prefer that that system uh, a lot. It's a proven system. You can use misters 
and fog uh, fog systems um, that will actually cool the air. So it's actually two different ways of cooling. One, you're cooling the air. The other one, you're actually cooling the animal. Uh, but also both systems, you have to consider also the humidity of the air. So uh, if the air is already humid, um, you can only be limited uh, with your misters and the efficiency of those misters, but they do work. So if nothing else, use those. If you cannot get those uh, those tubes and sprinklers in place uh, on the feed alley. OK, thank you, Wensi. There are no more questions. So OK, well, uh, again, I would uh, put my hat, my Klaus's hat on and uh, say a big thank you to everybody that joined. I appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules, um, especially those of you that have the fields and the cows to take care of. Um, hopefully that uh, has brought some some old but also new data to you and, and uh, really given you some thoughts uh, as to how important heat stress is and the, the ways to mitigate it. Uh, please call us, contact us with any, any questions that you have. And last, before, uh, before I leave, I want you to uh, just uh, take a look at our uh, next scheduled seminar. We will make a break for the summer. Uh, we will enjoy the, the sea, as, as you saw in the pictures. Uh, as we started, but uh, coming back in September, we will have uh, our next web webinar focused on, on poultry and the behavior uh, and pecking behavior of, of chicken. So those of you that are interested or have friends and colleagues that are interested in that topic, please don't hesitate to invite them and uh, see you soon. Good luck and bye from me.